Good morning. Good morning. Amen to that song. So, have you ever written a letter to someone and it got shared with thousands of people around the world? Me neither. Um, at one time I heard a preacher though share a letter that he had wrote to his friend, later wife, where he referred to her as dude repeatedly. He read that in front of a thousand, thousands of people. I'm not really sure why, but it made for a good laugh. Uh, nevertheless, there are times where somebody writes a letter and it gets saved and it's shared with people all over the world. One of my favorite missionary autobiographies, sort of, biography autobiography, is actually a bunch of letters compiled and put together from this guy. Uh, and the, these letters are encouraging. They are... Uh, Sometimes they, they issue warnings, and they motivate people to, uh, to live a godlier life. And so, you know, there are a number of those letters that God has put together for us to be read all over the world. And God has made it so that these letters fall into our hands to be read by us. Third John is one of those important letters. Now, 3 John is written by a guy named John the Elder to someone named Gaius. And Gaius is as common a name as James or John is today, back, back in this day. So we don't really have much info on who this particular Gaius is receiving the letter is. Uh, but the letters of John, they have this continuity and flow. So we're going to take a look at the short clip and, and kind of uh, warm us up what we're going to be getting into today. The letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1st John is actually anonymous, but 2nd and 3rd John are written by someone who's called the Elder. Now the language and style of all three of these works are identical to each other and to John's Gospel. And so most people think that all of them come from the disciple that Jesus loved. Now that could be John the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve apostles, or it could be another John among Jesus' earliest disciples known as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, he's now in his old age and he's overseeing a network of house church communities that are likely around the city of ancient Ephesus. Now from clues within the gospel and from these letters, it seems that these communities were made up mostly of Jewish followers of Jesus and that they had recently gone through a crisis that motivated John to write these letters. He mentions that a group of people have broken off from these churches. These people no longer acknowledge Jesus as Israel's Messiah or as the Son of God. And they're stirring up hostility among those who stayed faithful to the churches. In fact, 2nd and 3rd John clearly address this conflict. 2nd John is a warning to a specific house church. There are people who deny Jesus. John calls them deceivers. And they're probably going to come looking for validation or support. And this church community is not to offer any. 3rd John is actually written to a member of one of these house churches, a man named Gaius. And the elder asks him to welcome legitimate missionaries who are going to arrive soon. He has to tell him to do this because the leader of that church community, Diotrephes, is acting like a jerk. And he's rejecting anybody associated with John the Elder. And so these letters give us a window into the tension and conflict that John faced in these churches. And first John was written as a response to all of this as a form of damage control. The elder assures those who still believe in the Messiah, Jesus, that God is with them as they adhere to the truth. So, as we, if you want to, you can turn to, in your Bibles to 3rd John, but as we read and talk through this letter today, uh, let's open our hearts to where God uh, might need to do some work in us to encourage us, correct us, and spur us on to love one another. So, why don't we just start now? Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the letter to 3rd John. God, as we open it up today, may your spirit speak to our hearts. We might be more loving. We might want to follow you and love one another in the ways that we've been learning throughout this series on living in the land. God, you convict and move in us. Lord, may I just speak your words today. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's start off with 3 John, the, the first verse. It says, As the elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Now that actually isn't maybe the typical letter intro that you're going to find throughout the Bible. 
It's really short. It's uh, meaningful. I must say, it's not very often that I receive a letter that says, to my dear friend Colton. Um, usually it's just, hey Colton. And you know, Colt's good. So is Gaius. To my friend, to, sorry. To friend Gaius is good. To dear friend Gaius is better. But to my dear friend Gaius, that's a signal that John is writing to some kind, to someone who had, they had a meaning relationship with each other. This really matters to John. He, he, he cares about Gaius. He thinks about him. He actually loves him. But what kind of love? He loves in the truth. Okay, what exactly does that mean? Well, John has written about the truth time and time again in the letters of the first, second, and third John. So what is it? Well, it's the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the way, the truth, and the life. See, John has this love for Gaius, but it's not because Gaius is as smart as John, or as funny, or agrees with everything John says, not even because John just loves his smile and face. No way. That stuff doesn't matter to John. He says, I love this guy in truth. See, there's a bond between John and Gaius. We can have this bond too. That far outweighs any kind of outside or superficial thing. They have a relationship with the truth, with Jesus Christ, who has changed their life, and it makes it different in how they relate to one another. The way that our typical associations just don't quite measure up to. See, these guys, they're a match made in heaven. And what I mean when I say that is that their spiritual reality, because of what Jesus has done for them, is the basis for their deep friendship and love for one another. And it really shows up in this letter. Okay, well, read a little further. You're getting too bad up in this. Okay, now, I actually have a point to make here. John is about to bring up a stern warning about, really, how not to treat fellow believers. And he talks about what's going to get in the way of our love for one another. But first he's going to bring up something beautiful. A positive picture of where love for one another comes from. It comes from a heart that's been transformed by Jesus. And it allows us to love others deeply. We can love fellow Christians. Even those who are so different from us politically, socially, economically, ethnically. Even people who are strangers or even enemies. See, the love that we have comes from God. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because he first loved us. We know that he loved us by what he did on the cross. So let's, let's get into what, what John says to Gates. Dear friend, verse 2, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friends, dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name of the Lamb. Receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. See, Gaius hospitality is a testament to his relationship with Jesus. Uh, like first John, Gaius engages in love for the one another's of his life, even strangers, with practical hospitality, care, and grace. See, these people who come to his home, they didn't really do anything to deserve this kind of hospitality. He just simply gives it to them. And it's likely that a good people, that a good deal of the people that Gaius is, is entertaining in the garden, is having in his house, are traveling missionaries, taking the message of the gospel to other areas around, possibly Ephesus, like they said there, or encouraging the churches that John the Elder might be overseeing. They could also just be businessmen or businesswomen who have business that brought them to her where Gaius was. But either way, Gaius' love seems to have opened his eyes to those in need. Opened his eyes and it opened his heart to help him. And, and because his heart was open, he opened his door. His head, heart, and hands were fully 
engaged in living in the light and walking in light of the truth of the gospel. This is really a beautiful picture of the church being a church, caring for those in need. You know, we have cases among us. Recently, I heard of some people in our community, in our church, who a traveling missionary was coming through and they, they gave this missionary access to their vehicle, even though it was inconvenient for them. They did this because it was their love for God and others, their desire to build out the kingdom of God. In fact, our church is about to receive the same kind of hospitality this week. <laughs> we leave for the north, a group of us leave for the Northwest Territories this Friday. We have already had people open up their doors. Saddle Hills Victory Church in Rycroft, Alberta has opened up their doors to the team. And they're going to provide us with breakfast and lunch as we journey on our way to Fort Providence. We even had a few other people in Rycroft purchase hotel rooms for our drivers so that they could get a good night's rest. Now, what a blessing it is to have atheists in our Christian community who support the work of the Lord Jesus and love us that way. But John's letter also points out someone who was opposed to Gaius' work and brings up the attitude behind this opposition. So to turn to 3 John verse 9. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loved me first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil does not see you, God. Dio, Dio, Dio. Short name for Dio, Dio. If only you really were the only Christian to ever have this problem. You know, we need to make sure that we don't read Dio, Dio, Dio's story and be like, Who, me? Yes, you could be. Then who? <laughs> this letter won't let us just cast Dio, Dio, Dio aside as that guy. Without pressing the question, are we, or have we ever been, <coughs> Diotrephes, where we should have been gays? Now, the issue with Diotrephes wasn't that he was a false teacher, uh, as we heard of in 2 John. The danger of welcoming false teachers because of the message that they spread to the community. Those who don't believe that Jesus is the king, the Messiah. That's not the issue here for John. Diotrephes might have had his theology airtight. But it says here, Diotrephes loved to be first. Oh boy. Welcome to the first century. Scratch that. Welcome to the 21st century. It's really often that we can find the hashtag me first on Twitter when people are referring to how they either don't like other people or they just want to do their own thing. It's their way or the highway. And often we say that, it's my way or the highway. That's just who I am. I'm stubborn. It's a good something to grab onto. Or, or have you ever heard this one? I am the master of my own domain. Oh, I've probably said that a few times in my life. You know, I love having my own space that I'm in control of. And then I got married. And my wife has let me know that I am not the master of my own domain. <laughs> and I never really should have thought of this. See, we can't read 3 John and think that I am the master of my own domain can possibly be a Christian attitude or something that's even okay to consider in a few select circumstances. You know, it's not just that Diotrephes was content to just go about doing things his own way. He wanted control. He wanted to be first, to be in charge. Another translation says, he loves to be the leader. And you know, if there was an inkling that Diotrephes might not be in control, what did he do? But said that he basically slandered John. He spoke malicious nonsense about him. Spoke really negative things. Probably in order to drive a wedge between John and other people. So they would take his side. You know, honestly, in the church, sometimes things can come up. And we want to pick sides on secondary issues. We, we, we can sometimes make minor things, major things. You know, 
and, it, and it's usually not just about preserving the truth of the gospel. Excuse me. Preserving the truth of the gospel, as, as we read in 2 John, is really important. But oftentimes, we make these things that are secondary tests for fellowship. If you don't agree 100% with what I believe in this particular circumstance, we cannot hang out. We cannot go to the same church. And often this boils, this comes from an ego. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian and a man who uh, is, is pretty well known for his involvement in trying to assassinate Hitler, and he was hung for it, um, has some strong words for Diotrephes like uh, think like behavior in his book Life Together. Here's what he says. Every human wish that is injected into the Christian community is a hindrance to genuine community and must be banished if genuine community is to survive. He says this. See, the person who loves their dream of community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter of the Christian community. Even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest and earnest and sacrificial. See, what Bonhoeffer is pointing out is that there is danger in making a particular vision we have about the community of Christians that we want to be a part of, making that vision what we love, rather than the community that God has brought together. See, we are the orchestrators of Christian community. We don't enter into a community of Christians with demands and set up our own laws and then we judge our brothers and sisters and God himself accordingly. See, when we do that, we act as if we're the ones who are creating this Christian community, as if it's our dream that binds us together. That's not. Daryl Guder brings this up. He says that oftentimes about sin, one of the things that lies at the root of sin is the desire to have control. And idolatry, he says, is essentially making something that you can control, putting something else in control of your life is your number one to give you control over your own faith. And we, and we do that sometimes with our works. But Pastor Dave pointed out that the only kind of command we get um, or anything that has to do with control is self-control, which is a fruit of spirit, but not control of and Diotrephes is doing that. See, a big ego, as Alistair Beck says, a big ego combined with a bad attitude can wreak havoc in the church. You know, Diotrephes theology might have been airtight, but it didn't make its way from his head to his heart. His heart was still intent on building his own kingdom. He hadn't opened up his heart to be moved by the power of the gospel. To truly love in the truth. You know, Diotrephes' behavior gives evidence for his spiritual condition. You know, how you behave either reinforces what you believe or it calls it into question. That's what Alistair Pegg says. He says, basically for Diotrephes, it calls it, it leaves it into question. 1 John 4 2 says that whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever, whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And so instead, we have to realize that God has already laid the foundation for our fellowship with one another. Because God has bound us together in one body with other Christians in Jesus Christ. Long before we ever came into Summit Drive or into a church, so we enter this community not as demanders of our way, but as thankful recipients. We thank God for what he's done for us and for giving us brothers and sisters who live for him. See, living in the light, walking closely with God, won't look like the Eucharist, but more like Gaius, John, and Demetrius, caring for one another, using our gifts and opportunities to lead and to care for more and more people. So how do we do that? I'm going to bring up Demetrius here for a moment. That says here, Demetrius is well spoken of everyone, even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I at least want to point out that we want to be like Demetrius. We want the truth of the gospel to speak well of us. The love of Jesus that has so transformed our hearts, we want that to speak well of us. 
And this letter tells us that one of the ways that the truth can speak well, that our lives can imitate what is good, and we can walk in the truth, live in the light, with our hands, head, hands, and heart actively engaged in God's mission, is through hospitality. And so I'd like to kind of go through four, four, four things, applications, for this hospitality. How we can look at Gaius and Sam, contrast it with the other and say that when it comes to this, we want to practice hospitality this way. First, we need to stop putting our comfort first. You know, oftentimes how we show hospitality can be based on how convenient it is for us. But hospitality shouldn't be convenient. It's inconvenient. We need to stop trying to intentionally build our own kingdom by putting our comfort first. Instead, we need to open up our eyes and our hearts and our doors. See, God has a much bigger kingdom that we can be a part of building. And so oftentimes, one of the ways that, that, that our, our hearts kind of, it, it shows up in the, is in the way that we treat our homes, or the things that we own, or have ownership of. And what we need to do instead of practicing ownership is to practice stewardship, taking care of what God has given us, instead of clinging to them and holding to them tightly. We need to act as if with the blessings that God has given us, that they are God's and not our own. Um, some of you may, may have heard this story, but our Mer Meredith and I's first ever trip to Kamloops, we were shown hospitality at a really, in a really like inconvenient way for this person. Where our flight was delayed and we were not going to be able to show up here in the morning, our, our first day. And so uh, we, we, we made a new friend through this. We walked up to uh, one of the Air Canada customer uh, service associates. And we were like, how are we going to get here to Kamloops? And he basically ended up getting off his shift at 3 a.m., driving us all the way here, dropping us off at like 8 a.m., driving back to Vancouver, and then starting his next shift. <coughs> his name was Gord Vicker. He was He's still a friend of ours. He really is hospitality. He really shows hospitality. It wasn't just a one-time thing. He did it even though it was inconvenient. And he still does it, that kind of stuff today. The second way. So we can love and connect with people. Uh, Rosaria Butterfield, uh, she has an author on a book about hospitality, that, and she says that counterfeit hospitality, so not real, comes with strengths, where basically people say, if you simply agree with me, we will get along, and you can come into my kingdom. But that's not what a good host does. A good host connects. They do their best to help the guests feel comfortable and at ease, and they don't need to dominate the conversation. Tim Elmore um, has a really good little book on leadership and how hosts and guests can connect. He says that when we're hospitable, we're going to run into people who are like, oh, I do not like this person. I disagree with them. I argue with them. We just don't see eye to eye. How can I actually be hospitable with this person? He says, hey, you shouldn't just throw in the towel in favor of our own comfort and egos. Instead, we have served. And so he says, here's one of the helpful principles that might help you do that. Try the 101% principle. Find the 1% you have in common with that person and devote 100% of your attention to it. You know, maybe it's hockey, maybe it's music, maybe it's uh, some, something. Maybe it's even better yet. Your bond, your relationship with Jesus, like John and Gates. You know, 1 Peter 4 9 says, offer hospitality to one another. Without grumbling. Hospitality is an act of self-denial, not of making yourself first. The Ojibwe's goal of being first just doesn't gel with hospitality, with the self-emptying aspect of the good news of Jesus. Third thing, hospitality provides. You know, often when we show hospitality, we're preparing meals, we're planning activities, we're taking care of the needs of others. And there are a lot of needs around here. At Tim Elmore, again, he says this. He says, people today are crying out for relational leaders. Leaders who connect with their hearts, not just their heads. See, Diotrephes, he was all about his head, which was too big, and not connecting with people's hearts. So one of the ways we can do that is by 
by focusing on trying to add value to the lives of others. And he says, you can make it your goal to share your life in some way with every single person that you spend more than 10 minutes with. Now, someone once said, I don't remember what someone does or how well they did it. I remember how they made me feel. That's important. We, we aren't going to be perfect. But we do need to, because of the love of Jesus in our lives, show that we care and we're like really care. So instead of adding value to our own lives, let's add, let's add value to the lives of the others. Put it another way. Instead of building our own kingdom, let's build the kingdom of God. My fourth and, and final application point is that one of the beauties of hospitality is that it extends to the outsider. It's not just for your small group or family or people you like. You also get to invite potential friends over who, like Caius, you get to love the outsider, people who are strangers to you and maybe, maybe even strangers to the good news of Jesus. See, good hospitality is an outworking of the gospel. Good hospitality is often there. <coughs> It is missional in that it's an active part of building the kingdom of God, whether that's through providing for families who are passing through your area, or whether it's loving sacrificially or seeking to serve, or just being open to, you have dinner and you're, you're, you, have, you have a table, spot on your table open to other people. And we can do this, not only because we necessarily share the bond of the gospel with these people, but really because of the gospel has so transformed our hearts that we can love that way. And the Bible has a bunch of verses about how to extend hospitality to outsiders. And the catalyst is always what God has done for you. In the Old Testament, um, the laws of Leviticus say that when a foreigner resides among you in your land, don't mistreat them. A foreigner residing among you must be treated as a Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. He's saying, remember you were, you were foreigners. Love them. See, our love for one another comes out of the fact that God has loved us. That we were once foreigners. That we were once separate from God. Separated. And yet God moved in with his love and made us part of his family. The best and most amazing kind of hospitality there is. And so Paul, when he's talking about um, Gentile people who were Jewish coming into part of the kingdom of God, he says this in Ephesians 2. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant and the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You know what? That's the Hospitality comes because of the love that we've been given by Jesus Christ. We too were once strangers, outsiders. We were walking, traveling down the road of life, and we were brought in to the family of God because of the sacrificial love for us. Christ died for our sins. Hallelujah is right. Made a way so that we wouldn't stay strangers to God actually be brought into the family of God. This is great news. And that is what brings our community together. This is what keeps us together, spurs us on to love one another, to open our eyes to see the needs of the world around us, to open our hearts to care for those, to care and love for those we come into contact with, and to open our doors to really put this into practice in our, our closest, things we hold closest to us. So as we go here to the, from here today, Let's not seek to build our own little kingdom like the OG peace. But let's imitate the kind of love that our Savior Jesus showed. Let's open up our eyes, our hearts, and our doors like his and build up the kingdom of God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this letter. Warning to, to not be a Diotrephes, to not live and love to be first, but to open our hearts, our eyes to see the world around us, our hearts to love and care for them.
use our hands, open our doors to practically show hospitality to those who need it. To all of our brothers and sisters, and to those who are even outsiders who don't know your love yet. May we be a community that lives on mission to share the love in every aspect of our lives, to share the love of Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.